Intro. Recently, a new trailer for The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom dropped. Let's watch it together for context first. my servants. Sweep over Hyrule. Eliminate this kingdom and her allies. Leave no survivors! Stop him. power. Okay, now we should talk about what it promises for us Zelda fans. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share for more content. Every view means the world to me. Anyways, let's go. Part 1. How promises to fix Breath of the Wild's mistakes. 1.1, the lack of diversity. Okay, I'll start by saying that Breath of the Wild was an amazing game due to the amount of freedom it gave a player and other factors. It gave a map of Hyrule that was larger than anything before it, but that came with some sacrifice. The enemy diversity in Breath of the Wild is pretty low compared to other games. The story boss excluded the DLC are for four Blight Gadgets and Cloudy Gadgets who failed to provide unique identities for themselves. One consistent pattern of Zelda games is that the deck team overcompensates to fix the previous game's issue, whose be them real or perceived. For example, the Wind Waker when it came out was lambasted for its shell shaped cell shaded art cell, even though it's grown a fandom over the years. To compensate, Twilight Princess had a much more realistic art cell, even though there were moments of glare on realism that root immersion, such as Ganondorf's Muppet Mouth. With Skyward Sword, Breath of Wild's predecessor, its gameplay was too railroaded, so the design philosophy of Breath of Wild was maximum freedom. However, with this Trail of Tears of the Kingdom, they're not only bringing back big blinds who are bigger Bokoblins who lead Bokobli groups, but also elemental versions of MBC in the Age of Clarity, including the Bows versions. Of it's that, there is also the return of a Redead, which have it absence its Triforce heroes. Next, there's a multi head dragon, and it looks like it could be the 3D debut of Gleok, the Hydra boss from the original game. Like fellow original game boss Manhandler did in Hyrule Warriors, it gets a terrifying redesign. Gleok is on fire. There could not only be a fire Gleok, but also a nice Gleok and an electric Gleok. As for how I think a Gleok boss battle will go, you will have to target the decks to sever their heads, and once you cut off each head, it begins flying around, spitting elemental breath at you until you sever all the heads, then Gliok dies, or turns into a skeleton and tries to bum rush you. Oh, and the Zonai robot pot made of blocks that fight Link. Related to that, there's how they could imp 
the help it promised to improve the dungeons. Part 1.2 The Dungeon Monotony With a design philosophy for Brevewald's dungeons, it's clearly quantity over quality. Each Sheikah Shrine feels more like a puzzle room of a dungeon than a fully fledged dungeon. As for the Shrine's the Divine Beasts, they all have the same theme. Each of the Divine Beasts has you set get on the Divine Beast, reach terminals by manipulating the architecture, and fight a Blight Cannon. As for how they'd handle architectures and stab the vessels, I think they'll be hidden around the map and locked behind side quests. As for the Zonai, it looks like that their Magitech is more on the magic side than the technology side compared with Sheikah. If they are all Zonai dungeons, they could have different themes. Legend of Zelda dungeons can be separated into three categories according to Game Maker Toolkit's Boss Key Series, a puzzle box, a gauntlet, and the lock and keys. A puzzle box involves manipulating the dungeon's architecture to open up and close parts of it. The lock and key is about exploring and solving puzzles within the, the dungeon. And the gauntlet focuses on more on combat over puzzle solving and exploration. I'm thinking that there will be seven story dungeons and one final dungeon that you could only complete what the other seven are done. Like how the original game, Link could go for the first handful of levels in any order, but level 9, Ganon's Lair, is saved for last. I'm thinking that each dungeon will have you only able to explore so far before you get the dungeon item, which unlocks more of a dungeon to you, and test your knowledge on it. You'll also have to fight the boss key, and once you have a boss key, you can fight the boss, which will test your knowledge of a dungeon item to the max. The seven main dungeons can be done in any order, and can be revisited after defeating the boss, where you can return with war items to get treasures that you are unable to get in your previous visit. Speaking of, there's how they can fix item durability. 1.3 Weapon Durability the single most frustrating feature in Breath of the Wild is the durability system. Weapons last way too short to get any mileage from them. You could get rid of durability for good, but it looks like they're going to have a crafting system where you can craft weapons and vehicles. But here's an idea on how they could improve on that crafting, allowing you to repair weapons. My idea is that you could either use uh, you could either use other weapons or raw materials to craft from every fights to repair weapons. This will also deal with the fact that wet items are way too easy to collect. In my Breath of the Wild playthrough, my apple count ended up well into triple digits, more apples than anybody could realistically use. It could also play with a Master Sword being corroded almost all the way to the hilt by Gandorf's Malice. Perhaps the quest will involve fine materials to repair the Master Sword, make it more powerful. I'm thinking that there will be a wise flame, a powerful flame, and a courageous flame. Each one hidden in its own dungeon, exactly like Skyward Sword, each one improved the Master Sword somewhat. I'm thinking that the Courageous Flame will increase how long the Master Sword lasts per charge, the Wise Flame will increase attack range, and the Powerful Flame will increase attack power. Anyways, here's how Tears of a Kingdom will improve upon Breath of the Wild's best aspects. Part 2 how it promises to expand upon Breath of the Wild's best aspects. 2.1 A wider map. Breath of the Wild's map is large, but no one is lacking in depth. There aren't that many massive cave systems, so I'm thinking that the skylines of the deep underground will increase the amount of locales. We know that parts of the Kingdom of Hyrule are going to be airlifted, include definitely Hyrule Castle, presumably the Great Deku Tree. This airlifting could also bring up the Arbiter's Grounds in the Gerudo Desert, as when we saw them by the time Breath of the Wild, they have been almost completely submerged in the sand. The Arbiter's Grounds is one of Twilight Princess's most popular locations, because not only it has a fun dungeon item in the spinner, but the mini boss battle with the Death Sword and the climatic boss battle with Star Lord are both amazing. Also, there's the lore implications of the Arbiter's Grounds, as they were built after the Interloper War in order to host the Interlopers, whose creation the few shadows threatened to rival Hyrule's Triforce in sheer power. And once the Mirror of Twilight was completed, in went the Interlopers, whose descendants become the Twilight. Also, after Gandor's failed coup in the Child Timeline, he was imprisoned there before the Sages sent him to the Twilight Realm after he escaped his own execution by force choking the Sage of Water into dust. 
Another possibility is them bring back Skyloft, where the ancestors of the Hylians lived in the interim of Demise's first attempt to seize the Triforce, and as well, Demise. Perhaps there are a few people still living there. Perhaps they became the Uka or the Zonai. It would be somewhat disheartening to see an iconic location that became the hub of the very first game timeline-wise, now banned for eons, a shell of its former self. Another secret they could hide is perhaps the Great Deku Tree being uplifted from Korok Forest will allow you to go down and find the fossilized remains of the original Great Deku Tree from Ocarina of Time. Another thing that keeps me excited are the vehicles. 2.2 Vehicles Due to Breville Ball's physics system, there are many a record of someone who defeated the state builders to make a viable vehicle, even if it's to do something like ride a log or boulder from the Great De Plateau to Hyrule Castle. And now it seems like there is an official vehicle crafting system. We've seen the trailer that Link is in a shower tower with Sheikah Tep and that the platform he stands on has rooms on it that we transport. Seeing that at Guardian Arms right from around the platform include one hole in a spool thread or a microphone, it's possible that there, it's there where you can use the green glue to bind together raw material to broad the tower, as evident with Link fishing a tire from a tire pit to make vehicles, or perhaps Link's zone arm let them fire glue from his hand to let them bind together vehicle parts. The amount of vehicle customization makes me feel like they're adding the best parts of Phantom Maragos and Scare Tracks and improvement on them. While I haven't played those games, and probably never will due to my 3DS touchscreen no longer working, so I am not an expert on those. I still hold out hope that they will make a switch port or a port for desktop based on point and click controls as those games controls revolve around the touch screen and nothing else. Tangent aside, the prospect of customizing your own vehicles for an open world adventure sounds so amazing. One possibility I'd like to entertain is perhaps leaving a boat to explore further and include the sea. Possibly a series of islands that combine the best aspect of a Wind Waker and Fan Hourglass of Sea Fair. Possibly even the possibility of being able to build and pile the submarine and explore bodies of water that Link could only literally scratch the surface of in breath of wall. The Leviathan, Skeleton, and Hebra looks less like it belongs to any of the flying cetaceans seen in previous titles and more like it could belong to an aquatic King Dodongo. Perhaps the diving of the sea will have Link run into a very much alive, very much pirate marine to dock, and he'll have to bomb it. 2.3 Freedom Breville Ball's big selling point was the amount of freedom it gave players. After completing the Great Plateau, which acted as a tutorial area for the player, they could either go for the four divine beasts before Hyrule Castle or straight, go straight for Hyrule Castle. There are 120 shrines to conquer and 900 Koroks to find, and mobile ways to take down an opponent beat with sheer force or calculated finesse. I feel like Tears of the Kingdom will keep a good amount of that freedom while maintaining some railroading. I'd be satisfied if you were forced to do the seven main dungeons before the final dungeon, but the main dungeons can be done in any order. Also, I would like if they were to not lock certain content away if you get past a certain point like the Lionel gear or the chest and divine beasts. Anyways, as a good amount of freedom is given, I'm gonna move on to the next part. What they feel like I could expect for the game's plot. Part 3. What I could expect for plot. 3.1. Zelda. Last time we see Zelda, she's fallen into a ravine. Well, I've been conditioned to know that she lived, as nobody saw her land, if you look closely, you could see that the pit has a blood red glow, the same glow as the pure mouth that Gandalf wields. As the mouth in Breath of Wild had a purplish tint, I don't think that it's as pure or as powerful as the red mouth that Gandalf unleashes. I'm gonna think that Gandalf will be at, still be after the Triforce, and while his mouth attack on Link succeeds in damaging Link's right arm and corroding the Master Sword, as well as stealing the Triforce of Courage from him, Zelda probably holds the Triforce of Wisdom. I'm thinking that Zelda will manage to send the Triforce of Wisdom to the Sacred Realm, but the mouth will destroy your body. However, this is not the end. 
Zelda's spirit ends up in some sort of underworld. We do see in the trailer that Link is reaching out to Zelda, or what looks like her, as well as her doubting if she can help Link. So she begs a mysterious figure to lend her power to him. I'm thinking that after you beat each dungeon as Link, the perspective will change to Zelda and she will have to complete a trial that will help unlock her sacred power and let her bestow Link with a bit more power. Perhaps she ends up in an underworld inhabited by the spirits of the dead, which could be a good way for the champions and King Rom to return and for him to reconcile with his daughter, because we all know he wanted to if you read his diary, but he never got a chance because you know that fucking Ganon. <laughs> or further back with the original pilots of a divine beast 10,000 years ago, or even the hero shade, the spirit of a hero of time now to rest that his knowledge has been passed down could make a surprise reappearance. On the flip side, there's a possibility of Zelda fighting villains that have appeared in previous games like Zant, Majora, Vati, Bellum, Astor, Onox, and Varen. However, I feel like the most likely past antagonist to return is Girahim, because his status as a spirit of demise's master sword means that he could still be out there, and we last saw him revert to his sword form to aid demise. As Girahim acted as a contingency to demise imprisonment, it's possible that he's been working behind the scenes to revive the original demaking, and at the end, Zelda will become Goddess Hylia, and she he then will be able to get Link to stop Mandis of Demise Curse for good. Speaking of... 3.2 Ganondorf Ganondorf might have been mummified and sealed underground, but his quest for power hasn't ceased. It's clear he's not interested in ruling Hyrule anymore. He wants to destroy it. As this Gandorf is at his evilest, there's a question of if he knows of Demise's curse. If he does, I'm thinking that he won't care, and would act to stop the curse from being removed because to him it's a good thing. It means that it doesn't matter how many times he dies, how many times he fails to get to try for it, he can try again and again until he eventually succeeds. Until he succeeds in wiping out Hylia's divine bloodline and the spirit of her hero. By a series of clans, Ganon is indeed mindless but is being puppeteered by Gandor. Why I'm saying that is because Gandor was able to learn that mouths can be used to corrupt Shika technology, allow him to take it over the next great clan. The Ollie has to do now is wait until Zelda and Link bring the respective Triforce pieces to him, Zelda's wisdom and Link's courage seeing that he has power. And by the Divine Beast losing power, Link and Zelda will be lured underground in order to find the source, and they find Ganondorf, who's been imprisoned by his own nine magic, but still scheming his revenge. Now he attacks, forced in the hand of his him back to save Link, and to take him to the Sky Islands to heal, stealing the Triforce of Courage from him and turn the Blade of Evil's vein into a rusted stick. He also managed to kill Zelda's body, but he hides the Triforce of Wisdom in the Sacred Realm, and he is aiming to uh, use a massive sword to reopen the safe realm. I'm sure that Gandorf is also going to release Demise, albeit Demise will be in his imprisoned form by breaking the master sword. And while Ganondorf and Girahim are working with the Demise power, Zelda is working to unlock her full power of Hylia, and Link is working to recover from Gandorf's attack and repair the master sword. However, that buys enough time for a border of the Sacred Realm to be opened and the final battle happened there. Either the timeline becomes a loop with Gandalf becoming Demise and Zelda becoming Hylia, or the end of Demise's curse being broken for good. Next, there's the individual regions of Hyrule. 3.3 The Regions of Hyrule. With what's happening in each region of Hyrule, it's not too good. In Gerudo, the Mokuga, the traveling impacts. And as just one can give Link a lot of trouble, that's not looking too good. I'm thinking that Link will have to kill a certain number of Mokugas to progress the Gerudo Desert Arc. Death Mountain is erupting, but it's not a regular erupt, it's something much more malicious. It's possible that Gandorf is using the volcano to spew mouth all about the kingdom, as we did see mouth meteors from the moon that can be used to spawn in enemies. 
from the death down north, I could see Luke being forced to brave milestones as he entered the volcano and fight both the Asia, provide for a third time by Gandalf's mask in order to keep the system in mouth eruption. Also, there's a massive windstorm in Hebra threatening to veto the ability to fly. What I'm thinking is that there will be a dungeon, the center said. The windstorm that things will have to traverse. Two free fall mechanics. We could see the aerial battle, but the original would deem impossible. I could see, it could see the return of a Kior pair of a Manta Ray boss tool from the Minish Cap, or Arborok from Twilight Princess, or any other airborne boss, including the Wind Waker's Kalmarok King. As for Central Hyrule, Hyrule Castle is even more covered in mounts and has been airlifted. Perhaps the finale revolved around going into the castle to open up the path to Ganondor. In Hatina, Kira's lab is no longer active, presumably because he moved to research elsewhere. And the great death is he is missing. I'm thinking that as an earlier trailer showed Link climbed the roots of some sort of great tree, that he could have been simply airlifted. That's my dream boss. This and these are the major boss of the game that aren't the final boss. Each boss will be in a certain region, and here we are Volvadia and Elden, Colossus and Theron, Morphil and Lunaru, Star Lord and Gerudo, Halmarok King and Hebra, Bongo Bongo and Nekluda, and Gome and Gorok. These bosses were chosen to get high speech speech established in pre existing games, except for Halmarok King, but as he's a giant bird, he could go anywhere he wants. I'd love to see how well they can translate said boss battles into Tears of the Kingdom's gameplay and keep them just as fun as they were in their debut games. Mostly, those are from third part RP sources because, you know, I've only played the original A Link to the Past and Breath of Wild. But, people have spoken lonely about fighting those boss in other games. And yes, it's at the time of a recording. So yeah, I'd love to see what those bosses would look like in Tears of the Kingdom. And how you would fight them. Anyways, on to our game mechanics. Part 4, what I could expect for game mechanics. 4.1, crafting. With the crafting system, I'm seeing that the position of parts will be just as important as the parts itself, due to the physics system returning. If Link doesn't put his helicopter platform together right, he could end up flying around in the flying fidget spinner, but the world around the Hyrule uncontrollably. Of course, that could be used to kill some enemies. The glue for putting vehicles together could also be used to put weapons together, like the flamethrower, the shield combo, Link used against the light light orbit, Club bomb launcher combo that Link used against the luminous tower. It could be possible to mount a weapon onto the vehicle to create a tank, or a ship of a cannon, or a bomber jet, or incorporate the vehicle parts into the weapon. The lightning girl could also be used to give thrust and push a vehicle forward with how light lights work. I'm sure that they'll still try to steal the player's skill, but if the shield is on, it will backfire in their faces. I'm thinking that. Not only will there be a flamethrower, but a freezer of these freezing cold gas and the storm full of the with magnified like storm clouds. I'm thinking that the different means of motion will determine the vehicle's acceleration, top speed, braking, turning, and compatible terrain, and that different materials will determine what can and can't break the vehicle and how easily it can break. And the car has a tank of green fluid in it. My idea is that the green food is later with glue. Perhaps Link can collect it and fill tanks of it in case he needs it later. I do feel like crafting would give us unlimited possibilities. 4.2 Zone I Hand Ability. Like how the Sheikah Slate like replaced traditional dungeon items in Breathful Wild, we think that the Zone I Hand Ability will be replaced with the dungeon items. However, I think that instead of getting them all at the beginning of the game, you will get each one part way through each dungeon. That is so that the entire game isn't quite open once you have done the tutorial. And now keep some semblance of the order of events to happen while allowing you to do the main dungeons in any order. The hand ability includes reversing time, 
which will be replaced with the stasis, stretching the hand to interact with Dona and Growlit to replace with her main nieces and jump into the ceiling to replace with the Cryonics. With Alpha Hand, the only real tool for the reversing and grabbing ability to prisons similar to the respective room involved Cryonics is the one explosion in terms of the use to her jumping. Nintendo has made patents for those abilities in the fall mechanics, so we know how they will work. However, we don't know about the bomb room's counterpart. My guess is that the zone I hand can beat the bomb to itself, or that we will return to have a bomb to reflect the light and perhaps to tie into the crafting system, we can craft special bombs, perhaps bombs that work underwater, or spherical cubic, or imbued with elemental properties. I'm also thinking that they'll decide for us to upgrade the zone I hand abilities and still let the example armor act as substitute of the hookshot as it will let him grab onto certain objects and pull himself to them. Possibly it could combine the climbing mechanics from the original game to allow him to grab onto a wall, grab another wall, pull himself in, and rinse and repeat in a way that a lot has when it's just climbing. It could also be used to gliding just pulling in and giving a speed boost. 4.3 Combat for combat, we've seen that each of the Zonai abilities will have some use built in combat. No other way to be used to steal items, I'm thinking that the hand can be used to steal enemy items. As Link is fighting them with a rusted mouse crowed sword, I'm thinking that the general weapon durability will be increased significantly, though you don't have to search for weapons and craft materials as frequently as a previous game. As a trade off, I'm thinking that malicious enemies, which is what I'm calling enemies that have been infused with mouth while better stats will damage the weapon more quickly, and that weapon will show if we've been damaged. And the weapon onto a shield will attack while blocking your craft attack while carry, depending on how you build it. I feel like Breath of the Wild's combat system is a great, great base on the Tier of the Kingdom combat system, even though I feel like the Flurry Rush feature is a bit too powerful for half make it harder to execute and reduce it, and then there will be to have to keep counter warding. I, I feel like they could make the bone felt for the successful count to drop more items and be more likely to drop greater items like the counters in the Metroid Sands return to Metroid Sand. And that leads us to the next part, the games that I'm designing myself. Part 5, a similar game I'm making, Shameless Self Promotion. 5.1 Overview Okay, I'm rebooting the vault. The MAC series I was working on prior. It's now going to be a video game design unity. It's still about a girl named Caitlin Bry who wakes up from crisis without her memories and she has to unlock her memories as she discovers her powers and search for the 12 keys to the vault. However, I'm getting rid of the spacefaring elements in order to focus more on planetary exploration. I'm thinking of giving the two endings, a bad ending and a true ending. In order to get the true ending, you'll need to do a certain amount of side quests with NPCs, like a majority of them, start a romance of any one romantic option, and collect all the memories. The theme of Caitlyn's character arc will be her traumas and healing from it. In the bad ending, she doesn't properly process the traumas caused in the bad ending, and in the true ending, she's able to process the traumas in a healthy manner, resulting in a better outcome. Also, I'm thinking that the final boss will be different depending on if you're going for a bad ending or a true ending. For the game itself, I'm thinking that it will be an open world game similar to Breath of the Wild, where you have to explore the dungeons in a specific order to battle the boss and unlock more abilities. Your abilities will unlock new areas and will make mandatory revisits to areas feel fresh by including new passageways that give access to once inaccessible collectibles and make it faster to get from one point to another. Maybe a bit of both to reward exploration and memorization. I'm feeling like they will not only be your mandatory abilities, but also upgrades to Caitlyn's health and attack power that she collects along the way and as enemy health and attack power scaled up. Also, complete side quests will give you ability upgrades so Caitlyn can take more damage, deal more damage, and unlock new ways to move and attack. Perhaps the side quests will reward familiarizing areas you've previously explored. For example, I'm thinking that there will be an NPC that gives you side quests where you have to brace them from one location to another. I, I will build it with little hand holding and a lot of discovery. Where the starting area is 
where it's established that Caitlyn can travel in any direction and that she can jump, crouch, crawl, break obstacles with her immense strength, lift, carry, and throw certain objects to solve puzzles. And after that, she gets a bit of a combat tutorial and I introduce you to get new abilities of a health upgrade after that first encounter. And after that, your base abilities will be tested as you go to the first boss, fight the first boss, and if you kill it, you get your first major ability upgrade. Not only will increase Caitlyn's jump height by a certain amount, but it also lets her jump very high by crouching before leaping, and that leads us right into talking about Caitlyn's abilities themselves. 5.2 Abilities With Caitlyn's first major ability, a boost to a jump height allows to reach heights and cross gaps that were previously inaccessible to her. The next major ability that allows her to progress is her ability to fall water from the palms of her hands and her feet eat. The water gun is weaker than her melee attack, which lets her counter variety of enemy attacks and break rocks, but it travels a lot further than her melee attack. The water gun is effective against firing to electrify the enemy that Caitlyn was previously completely unnamed to attack. However, the water gun is ineffective against aquatic enemies and enemies that have been waterproofed. Not only can the water gun be used in combat, but it's also good for solving puzzles. The water gun can be used to put out fires, power rotating turbines, make road plants grow, and push rafts across water. Also, the water gun can be upgraded by being side quests that show one's mastery over it. I'm thinking that there will be an upgrade that lets Caitlyn spray water in multiple directions at once, as well as an upgrade that lets Caitlyn fall water behind her, allowing herself to boost through water at high speed. Eats. I'm thinking that using and modifying Unity's physics system will make using all of Caitlyn's abilities in combat, exploration, and puzzle solving quite fun. For example, I will add in body the water to flow, allowing to serve certain puzzles in them. There will also be a buoyancy system for how it works. I'm seeing that lighter objects like wood will flow to the surface while heavy stones will sink. Caitlyn can swim both upwards, downwards, or horizontally, and she will have an air meter. If that air meter runs out, she will quickly lose health until she finds an air bubble or surface. That will limit Caitlyn's underwater exploration until she fights and defeats an aquatic boss that lets her breathe underwater. That will open the oceanic area's depth wide open for her. I'm thinking that enemies that aren't aquatic will drown in water, and most aquatic enemies will die from being beached. But there'll be amphibious enemies that do well both on dry land and in the water. I'm thinking that we'll also have pits of murky water that sap Caitlyn's oxygen meter fast than clean, oxygen rich water and she'll have an oxygen meter even with water respiration until she has it upgraded to breathe indefinitely in murky water. 5.3 Speed Run While I feel like the game discourages speedrunning by requiring you to get a certain amount of objectives to get the true ending, if you build it, they will come. I'm sure that there will be a category for both a bad ending and a true ending, and while each one has the any percent category, for those who don't know speedrunning, the any percent is just to beat the game as fast as possible, the true ending will have a 100% category, which is to collect all collectibles and complete all side quests before beating the game as fast as po possible, and the bad ending will have a low percent category. The low percent category is the lesser known little brother the any percent category. And often they're one the same, but whenever they're different, the low percent category is to beat the game while collecting as few items as possible. The low, low percent speedrun prioritizes skipping items over minimizing time. For an example of how a low percent speedrun works, the current any percent world record for Twilight Princess is 2 hours and 51 minutes and the current 100% world record for Twilight Princess is 6 hours and 17 minutes, which is well more than twice that of the any percent, both by the American speedrunner Bewilderbeast on the GameCube. As for the low percent record, it's 25 hours, which means it takes literally all day and a bit more to complete. In order to do the low percent, Anarakis stared at Ruby for 17 hours, taking advantage of known the glitch known's item sign, which takes advantage of a cycle that Link goes through when he collects an item, but to allow him to slide backwards through locked doors, he'd otherwise need a key to get past. 
However, that allowed and rack is to skip a few items to manage the run as a low percent world record. Not only do I think that base game speedruns will be a thing, but also randomizer speedruns. I'm thinking that the vault will have a randomizer mode that rearranges where and when you get each and every ability and ability upgrade. I will add a few things into the first area so that the game is randomizer friendly and there's a minimal chance of a player getting soft locked as well to in main in the regular game foreshadow what abilities you'll get and reward backtracking. I'm, I'd love to see what kinds of glitches the community discovers and how to use them to minimize the time it takes to beat the game or how to skip as many items as it is possible to beat the game. And that's all I have to say about the vault, my current game project. Conclusion That wraps up my predictions for the plotted gameplay of Tears of the Kingdom that I've come up with based on what I was able to glean from the trailer as well as contextualizing it from the previous trailers that were released, as well as the shameless self-promotion about the Zelda-like game I'm making. Anyways, please remember to like, subscribe, and share for more content as you all mean the world to me. Tyson out.